Welcome everyone. Um, I really enjoyed our last micronutrient review and um, got good responses to it. So I hope you all enjoy this one just as much. Um, let's move, let's just get started right in. Today we're going to be talking about water, the water soluble nutrients. And um, before that, uh, I have a little bit of cleanup to do on answering a question about vitamin E and tocotrienols. So for those of you who did not um, join us last time, there's just a couple of introductory slides here um, that I'll repeat a little bit. Um, what we talk about in our metabolic code um, health programs is, you know, health, for health and weight management, it's a lot more than just everybody can eat a certain diet or, you know, um, just make sure people have enough nutrients and, you know, you'll be good. We're, we're building our health programs around other factors that can have a huge impact on overall metabolic function like stress, um, gut health, anything that can influence thyroid, which can be anything from toxins in the environment to a gut health related core problem of autoimmune thyroid issues. So um, we, we look at things from a more global um, systems biology type approach. But um, we do still have to pay attention to micronutrient status. And the reason why I've highlighted all the um, topics like insulin resistance, gut health, stress, thyroid in, in green, in the light green, is because your micronutrients can impact any of these areas. So this is uh, the reason why I decided to do um, a review of micronutrients because um, it does impact every area and um, Believe it or not, we do still see some common, uh, some things that we see that indicate people not getting quite enough of certain micronutrients. So uh, it does still come up. This is just a quick rundown of some of the nutrients that are needed for each area. For insulin resistance, the big three, magnesium, chromium, zinc. Uh, vanadium is an important trace mineral. Thiamine, I'll kind of be reviewing some information about at that and its role. Um, you know, gut health, um, in terms of micronutrients, zinc can be an important one. For stress, magnesium is huge, or B vitamins and vitamin C, because it's actually um, a nutrient that um, is needed by the adrenal glands in relatively high amounts. Um, so this is just kind of a quick rundown and listing of all the things, all the different nutrients that are needed for, for different things in the body just to drive home the point of how the micronutrient intake can influence this. So as we review, I go through the nutrient itself, what it's needed for in the body, the deficiency symptoms that we most commonly see, are there any toxicity issues with the nutrient, and then what the RDAs or DRIs are for that nutrient, along with upper limit on that, and um, food sources and then if there's anything else that influences, you know, the particular nutrient. Now, um, this is a repeat slide, but I just want to, um, I've got some slides toward the end of the presentation that really drive this point home about the different nutrients that you get from the different um, families of food. So with fruits, for example, your primary macronutrient in fruit, fruits it's, um, are your sugars, so it's carbs. Uh, you'll see like things like maybe a gram of a protein in a fruit, and it's normally in the skin. So, but it, they, it comes along with a good bit of water in each piece of fruit that you eat. There's always a little bit of fiber, but the, the micronutrients that you tend to get in fruits are vitamin C and bioflavonoids, um, depending on the color of the fruit, you know, maybe some beta carotene or, you know, vitamin A source. You'll see folate pretty commonly and always a good bit of potassium. Uh, surprisingly, there'll be trace amounts of fatty acids. Now, now, notice that I have the arrow up on fruits because that means you get more sugars with those. With vegetables, 
the, it's kind of the same package. You get a lot of water, you get a lot of fiber, you'll tend to see a good bit of folate, vitamin A, vitamin C, and a lot of potassium, um, but in a much lower sugar package. So they, vegetables do contain um, the macronutrients, carbs, and, the, but, and all the carbs coming in there are almost all from glucose and fructose, but um, way fewer sugars per serving than compared to fruits. And a similar rundown that I gave for grains. Now, one of the things that you'll read about, um, you know, when it comes to intake of grains, because it's all viewed as, uh, you know, this gluten-free diets are viewed as kind of a fad thing and people say, well, you need to get whole wheat uh, because that's one of the best sources of your B vitamins, as if you can't get B vitamins from any other food. So I've got some interesting slides for you towards the end of this, but with grains we get carbs but in the form of starch, not sugars, and you'll get some water but not nearly as much. Grains can have a lot of fiber, depending on what grain category it is, and a good bit of um, different other micronutrients. In particular, if they're whole grains like whole wheat, it's a good source of selenium. And then your protein foods um, bring with them more than just the proteins and amino acids. They, they, of course, we get some fats in them. But you'd be surprised at the, um, the different B vitamins but, and um, minerals that you get in animal proteins. So I'd just like to make the, the point um, that um, how the different food categories and what are the nutrients that you get from each of those types of foods. Okay, let's move on, Libby. And I don't want to dwell on this one. Um, I want to get on to our other slides, but just making the point that the studies do consistently show that we have a chronic under intake of a lot of the micronutrients, and the reason is because people don't eat enough of the most nutrient-dense foods, the fruits and vegetables. They tend to take in a lot of refined sugars, refined flours, heck, they're, you know, you look at some diet foods and you're eating a mass of something, but, you know, there, there are hardly any new, real nutrients in them. So it's very possible to get through a lot of days eating very few really good um, energy uh, nutrient packet foods. So, um, and then even if you do try to eat more con you know, conscientiously and eat healthy. Uh, we have this challenge that the nutrients in foods are declining, and I went through this early in the part one of this uh, webinar, but just to remind you, one of the examples was there are people that have been following the nutrition content of foods from the 1950s to the present day, and every year the nutrients tend to go down, down, down. So, for an example, magnesium and Brussels sprouts from the 1950s to now is, has um, reduced to less than half what it used to be. Because if you think about that, the RDA for magnesium is about um, 300 milligrams. Um, you look at taking in 100 grams of that food, that's about a half a cup, and you just think, well, if I eat a cup of Brussels sprouts each day and I eat a, a green salad that's loaded with magnesium and I have new nuts and seeds, I could come pretty close with a decent, you know, nutrient-dense diet back in the day, but not on these 8 milligrams per 100 or less. So, so the nutrients in our foods are declining. And in addition, we have things that tend to deplete nutrients on us. If we're having to take um, prescriptions of any type, if a woman's on oral contraceptives, you know, we're not even talking necessarily treating um, something, but if you're on a, you know, something for birth control, the oral contraceptives deplete a lot of nutrients. But look here, real common, metformin depletes B12. That's a very common, you know, drug for insulin resistance, as you most of you should know. So it's just um, between the combination of the nutrients and foods declining, uh, people might need to be on a medication of some type that, that depletes nutrients. And then we, we could have increased needs as well. So, 
you know, um, when you're when you're under a lot of chronic stress, your body burns through B vitamins much more quickly and vitamin C. And another big thing that in causes increased need is the fact that our body has to deal with the uh, so many toxins now from our environment. So, you know, when you look at the list, which I've got in an upcoming slide of all the vitamins and minerals needed for um, our phase one and phase two detox pathways, we're, we're probably at a time where we have a much increased need just from environmental toxicity alone. So when you put this all together, it means we really have to pay attention to micronutrient intake. So these are the slides showing pathways of liver detoxification and the nutrient needs that this creates. So you have chemical X, just fill in the blank, any, any type of chemical category. Um, the first process that the chemical has to go through is phase one where the, the chemical becomes more water soluble because of phase one activity. So these are all the cytochrome P450 enzymes that work on the substance and change it and start breaking it down in a sense. And these processes cause a lot of um, free radicals. So one of the main things that's needed uh, in response is we need antioxidants to help neutralize those free radicals that get created. So then you go down below with phase two and you see there are different phase two pathways. There's the glucuronidation pathway, which needs fiber which is a macronutrient, but magnesium and B vitamins in particular, and also sulfur compounds. Or there's your acetylation pathways that need more of your B vitamins and C vitamins, and they um, require a base amino acid for these processes. And then there's your glutathione pathway, where we need a lot of um, cysteine and our methylating vitamins, which are, of course, your B6, B12, and folate. So um, that just gives you a baseline of a few. So I think it's the next slide where I have them listed out by phase one and phase two um, specifically. We can go ahead and advance. So you see here antioxidants are at the top of the list for phase one. We also need choline, vitamin C, vitamin E, niacin, copper, magnesium, zinc, and omega-3 fats are all nutrients that are needed for phase one processes. And phase two, um, we need all those amino acids that I showed and had listed, folate, magnesium, manganese, selenium, riboflavin, panathetic, vitamin C, and zinc. And I'm not sure that this is completely comprehensive. There may be a few more, but just to give you an idea of how much our detoxification processes of the body require a lot of micronutrients. Okay, now let's do our cleanup about vitamin E. Last time I talked about vitamin E and tocotrienols as a another um, family of vitamin E um, molecules. So basically what uh, the question was is what is the dosage? So um, I thought I'd just go through a little bit of background information first in that so we can explain what, what tocotrienols are basically. You can think of it as like a, a vitamin E family that's similar to tocopherols, but they're structurally distinct. And um, they're also contained in the same parts of the, of the plant, the endosperm of nuts and seeds. The, um, the uh, oh, I'm not thinking of the word, but like the, kernel in the, in the middle of an apricot, the dicot in the middle, it's like the seed and the, that type of fruit like peaches and apricots that would contain some. And it's also in palm and um, rice bran oil. Now what's going, been going on lately is looking at the action of tocotrienols in the body and what they're finding is that um, it seems to be much more potent than even uh, the 
alpha tocopherol and delta tocopherol, the tocopherols in terms of its antioxidant capacity and therefore its ability to be neuroprotective in particular is an area that's being researched. But it seems to have very strong anti-cancer um, activity as well and in fact they're looking at tocotrienols um, they're looking at delivering them along with chemotherapeutic agents and finding it to help the, um, the ability of chemotherapies to work better because of the fact that they take out some of these inflammatory pathways that end up um, causing uh, the chemotherapeutic agents to not be effective against the cancer. So it's a real exciting area of research, but they're so anti-inflammatory um, they, because they inhibit COX-2 enzymes. They also inhibit um, IL-6 and TNF-alpha production, so very, very potent anti-inflammatory actions. And I think we should have another line or two there. So one of the issues that has come up with tocotrienols is the fact that um, they don't have a transport mechanism. Um, if you look at the information on the Linus Pauling Library, which I recommended to you last night, uh, last time, it's uh, Linus Pauling uh, Institute is uh, part of Oregon State. Um, they have fantastic information on each of the nutrients, and they have said that basically they they seem to not pay a ton of attention to tocotrienols because of the fact that the body only has a transport mechanism for tocopherols and they get transported with a tocopherol transport protein. So they've been looking at, well, how do tocotrienols absorb? They, they don't have a known transport mechanism um, for a long time. Now they're found that they, they absorb through the micelles into lymphatics. So anything that directs that absorbs rather directly like that you need fat in the diet and you need bile salts to be able to absorb them but from there they circulate and they they exert their mechanism of action and then they're excreted um, so what we're what manufacturers are doing is looking for the best way to the best types of emulsions that will improve the absorption of tocotrienols. Is there another line there, Libby? Okay, so the dosages. Um, so I was a little bit high um, when I on my guess on part one. The dosages um, depends on the manufacturer. So you really and the and whether it's just gamma tocopherol or delta tocopherol or tocotrienols or tocotrienol mix. So you really kind of have to follow the manufacturer's instructions for dosages, but you'll see more uh, in line with like the 50 to 100 milligram dosages. And if you, um, for example, if you look on life extension, they have said that, you know, higher dosages like 200 milligrams that some of the tocotrienol can actually convert to tocopherol. So it doesn't necessarily do uh, a lot of good to take higher dosages. Um, but I know I've seen higher dosages and that's why I say, uh, you know, you, you should follow manufacturer and, um, instructions as, and information as close as possible. Because if you look at studies, um, there was a study on that showed that tocotrienol from palm oil reduced carotid artery plaque, that was a 240 milligram dose. So um, that information and products will probably continue to evolve, but um, it, from the sounds of the information, you can be effective with um, cholesterol and um, different things that you're if you're using it as an anti-inflammatory, you could actually measure IL-6 and see, you know, the response to it from before and after blood labs. But it uh, sounds like you'll be effective in um, 100 milligram on average 100 milligram dosages. So let's get into our water-soluble vitamins, um, vitamin C. 
um, we start out with. This is uh, an amazing nutrient. For maintenance, I really do feel that, you know, the um, once you have a person sort of metabolically more balanced, more nutritionally balanced, and they're eating a good bit of fruits and vegetables, I feel like you could get by with a, you know, 90, 90 milligrams is the DRI for men and 75 milligrams is the DRI for women. Uh, you can keep most people pretty healthy and well on those types of dosages. When uh, what happens with vitamin C is you can when people get a virus for example, you can uh, the the con it's like it increases the demand. So it's a conditional demand. So if someone gets a cold, I have no problem upping the dosages to, you know, two to five grams per day or 2,000 to 5,000 milligrams or more. So um, getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the it's water soluble. Um, it's got very low toxicity and um, there are some astronomically high dosages that are being used in the literature for things like, um, you know, antiviral with HIV and things like that. But collagen is needed for, um, vitamin C is needed for collagen formation. That's one of the primary uses. Um, it is a potent antioxidant. But you really need to think in terms of vitamin C as a, a really important immune support. Um, I'll never forget in my, bi, um, my biochemistry class in college, took a couple of biochemistry courses and my professor studied vitamin C for a while and what he said was that they couldn't believe how much more active immune cells became when, when a dose of vitamin C was given. And I've never forgotten that because I know a lot of the studies would have you think that vitamin C does almost nothing and for example for fighting a cold. However, most of the studies don't go up all that high on dosage. And um, what it came, comes down to is a pretty solid um, reduction of time or duration or severity of symptoms of cold and flu. And most people will take that. And um, the bottom line for me is it's not a question whether, whether vitamin C supports immune uh, function. It absolutely does. It's just a matter of dose. And I've come to believe that the problem is people don't probably take quite enough. So we go really high on doses, you know, up to, I'd say, not over 10 grams for a cold or flu, but up to that. And uh, in higher doses during the episode, it's much more effective. And then you just go back to a regular, everyday sort of maintenance after that. Uh, vitamin C is needed for adrenaline, for the adrenals big time, for cortisol production. Um, keep yourself with good intakes of vitamin C. It, it can help the adrenal glands from becoming um, depleted. It enhances iron absorption and it enhances carnitine production. It's needed um, to help the body metabolize and take care of histamine. So when we see people that are having problems with, you know, itchiness in their skin or a lot of histamine production that's affecting asthma or allergies, environmental allergies, we like to do vitamin C flushes. So this is where the person takes um, a, vit a buffered vitamin C powder and a half a teaspoon or a teaspoon or at a time every half hour to one hour they take a dose and we say to take it to bowel tolerance so what that means is you take it until you finally will um, get a loose stool and that's your bowel tolerance and then whatever that dosage is the amount that you've taken total to um, to create the loose stool let's say you have to take um, let's go high let's say 20 grams then you cut that in half, 10 grams would be that person's um, dosage of vitamin C to take. Um, and we don't normally keep them on it indefinitely, keep them on it for um, a few weeks to a few months. 
But um, when you know people need vitamin C just on uh, appearance or looking, uh, the most common things that you'll see are bleeding gums. Um, you can almost get a good, after so many years, you can almost kind of tell a person that's got some swelling in their gum tissue and sometimes it'll look kind of red, sometimes not, but just uh, you can tell it's kind of swelled. So um, I'll ask people, do you have any problems with bleeding gums? Or you can just make that uh, a question if you have an intake questionnaire. Um, so if people have a lot of broken capillaries in their face or if they bruise easily, these are signs that their body hasn't made you know, good collagen. Or if you just see that they're um, more easily wrinkled, you know, have a good more a uh, bit more wrinkling in their skin, perhaps vitamin C could um, be boosted. Although normally when I see a lot of wrinkling in the skin, a person that's wrinkled a little more than they should be for their age, uh, I think in terms of something that's broken down their gut, like they're gluten intolerant and they just aren't absorbing any nutrients very well. But it's very common to see the bleeding gums and people reporting that they bruise easily. Or if people um, have allergy and inflammation uh, symptoms like I mentioned, like asthma, uh, exercise induced, you know, problems with asthma, they need more vitamin C. Or if they just say, you know, I, I sure do get an awful lot of colds and flu. Vitamin C won't always take care of the problem alone if that's the case, if they seem to have depressed immunity, because typically it is also suppressed from something else, either um, high sugar diet and or um, what we see most commonly is just they've been under uh, an awful lot of chronic long-term stress and that will suppress immunity. So um, toxicity, um, the upper limit in terms of the, the DRIs is set at 2,000 milligrams. And that is because some people will develop diarrhea at that amount. But um, on the Linus Pauling site, they say that 2 to 10 grams per day is very, very well tolerated. There is one minor issue um, that might not be so minor if you've gotten kidney stones, but um, dosages of 1,500 milligrams in one study did find that it increased the risk of kidney stones somewhat. This was a study in men. But the studies have not been consistent on that at all, um, whether it does increase risk for kidney stones. They know that when people take in more vitamin C, you have more oxalates in the urine. But it doesn't always necessarily mean that it's going to be prone to forming into a kidney stone. So that's, that's the rub with that. My bottom line on vitamin C is I'm... Um, if I'm having to give constant, you know, five gram or up dosages, I think the people have something else going on. So um, I, we really tend to work more in the 500 milligram range or 250 to 500 milligram in terms of a maintenance dose. Um, like I said, once we have everybody's issue, other issues worked out, and then we have it on hand for being able to take higher dosages if you start to feel a cold or flu coming on. And then, of course, you can get plenty of vitamin C when you're eating a lot of your fruits and vegetables. Kiwis are a particularly good source. And um, bell peppers, the, the red peppers are actually the highest, but strawberries. So a lot of easy ways to get good vitamin C in your diet. Uh, this was just an interesting study that showed that, um, you know, vitamin C is needed to help uh, make carnitine, which is, you know, the substance that shuttles energy for the heart muscle. And um, what this study found was that um, in obese individuals that were put on vitamin C um, with exercise, and then there was placebo group that had no vitamin C but just did the same amount of exercise. Uh, interesting, it was very significant um, in the results. The vitamin C group, the heart rate reduced significantly, uh, lowered on average 11 beats per minute compared to the non-vitamin C group, which lowered only 3 beats per minute. And um, 
the uh, perception of exertion decreased and the general fatigue score decreased. So people did not get as fatigued with exercise when they were on vitamin C. And they actually got more, uh, their, I, I don't know if it's this study or another one, but it improves fat burning. So um, if you have someone that's real overweight and um, they have a little bit of problems with stamina during exercise, vitamin C is something that can help. And that was a moderate dose there. Okay, moving on. Thiamine. Um, important B vitamin. Surprising what it can do with that little 1.2 to 1.1 milligram for men or women um, DRI. <laughs> so it, it's super important. Uh, it functions as a coenzyme in, in energy production. So carbohydrate metabolism and ATP production. It's a super important substance. It also is important for the metabolism of your branch chain amino acids and for the production of acetylcholine, which of course is our, our memory molecule. But newer information that um, a lot of people aren't aware of is how important thiamine is for insulin synthesis. And of course, all the B vitamins play a different role in our neurotransmitter production. So super important for you know mood and outlook. You will, um, if you, if any of you have ever worked in a hospital, as you know, you will see B vitamin um, depletion symptoms in people um, who are re trying to recover from alcoholism. So Wernicke's encephalopathy is what we see in alcoholics. So thiamine gets depleted from alcohol. And when people have out and out deficiency, it's the very, very, of course, which we only see nowadays pretty much in an alcoholic sometimes. Um, but what we'll see more typically are things like a person who tends to be very nervous or irritable, depressed, because it's so important for energy production. T that's why um, I think fatigue a lot of times goes along with depression, because you're just not making energy like you should. And sometimes it'll cause a lowered um, appetite. So, our, but our big focus to nowadays really with thiamine besides mood and, um, you know, stress, mood, those types of issues, we're also really looking to thiamine to help with um, better um, insulin and glucose regulation. And the good sources of thiamine are beans and legumes, um, but look at the best source listed here, pork. Um, 80... 0.81 milligrams per three ounces. So that's almost the RDA. You could get the RD, RDA easily with, you know, uh, four or five ounces of um, pork. Whole grains are a, a okay source, and wheat germ. Now, uh, wheat germ is listed as a great source, but look at this. It's a whole cup, and it's really hard to eat a whole cup of wheat germ. Uh, normally you would put maybe a, t a tablespoon on top of your other cereal. But anyway, it's a, it's a decent source if you tolerate wheat. Um, and no known toxicity to thiamine. There's no upper limit set on it. Um, as I said, alcohol depletes. And there's the thought that some of the tannins in coffee and tea may lower the absorption somewhat. So... Um, so many people are daily coffee and tea drinkers. Um, that's one thing that may make people need to have a little bit more than that DRI amount. Um, but in terms of recommended dosage, you'll very, very frequently see far over the RDA in multivitamins and minerals, for example, it's not uncommon to see you know, 10 milligram dosages, they're very, very well tolerated. And um, just due to things like daily use of alcohol and coffee and tea, I would say you should uh, probably look to double, get at least double the, the DRI dosages to make sure that you're getting um, plenty. Our next one is B2 riboflavin. And again, the dosages are not that high for for what uh, all the jobs that riboflavin does, in particular, it's 
um, needed in the Krebs cycle for ATP production. It uh, is also needed for folate and B6 conversion. So when you take in folate from a food, if you don't have a little bit of riboflavin, you won't be able to convert folate to the active form or B6. So that's why they always recommend, you know, not taking B vitamins in uh, separately, but being best to take them in complexes. Not only because uh, folate and B6 need riboflavin for conversion, but because the um, taking in a lot of one will tend to block absorption of another one. So you always want to take them in and balance. But uh, riboflavin, look here. A really important role in keeping glutathione active in the body and um, therefore it's very critical for lowering uh, oxidative stress because glutathione as you know is uh, an important um, antioxidant for the body. Interesting um, deficiency symptoms that you see with riboflavin. Riboflavin will cause a redness and swelling in the in the tongue in particular. But if you see people that have real red lips and real red tongue, uh, think B2 deficiency. Chelosis is the cracks at the corners of the mouth. And normally if I see someone with chelosis, uh, they're on a lot of medication. So they're on things that are depleting uh, their, their nutrients. If you see, I don't see this very often, but if you see an oily, like scaly skin around the nose and mouth, that's associated with uh, riboflavin. And again, um, riboflavin is, you know, of course, needed for um, neurotransmitter. All the B vitamins are so. You'll see that um, depression is listed as a deficiency symptom and uh, nervousness again. Hypersensitivity to light is a big one. Um, oh, and you know one that I didn't list on here. Uh, people will report they have burning in their feet. Think of primarily riboflavin for that, but all the B vitamins are important for that. Um, but hypersensitivity to light. If you have people that are hypersensitive to light, I think, I think of uh, riboflavin. And they've also got some interesting studies on um, use of riboflavin uh, to help prevent migraines. What they're finding out now, as you know, if I see someone who has chelosis or a red tongue, I mean, that's getting pretty cl close to an out-and-out -out deficiency. But what we're looking at more and more, as you know, with nutrients is how much of our chronic not enough or inadequate intake on a daily basis is contributing to things like cataracts. You know, be, um, they've actually looked at intake of riboflavin and higher intakes help reduce risk of cataracts uh, as well as stroke and cancer and cardiovascular disease. So, And a lot of it is just because it's so important for that glutathione and keeping, you know, helps keep inflammation down in the body. This is another one that there's no known toxicity or that's why they have not set an upper limit. Uh, riboflavin is the one that makes your urine turn yellow when you take a multivitamin. That's from the riboflavin specifically. So source, good sources are milk, again, if you tolerate it, um, eggs, cheese, almonds, salmon, spinach, beef, broccoli. And I look at these and I go, I eat a lot of these foods pretty much, <laughs> I eat some of these pretty much daily, you know. Um, between all these, between eggs, cheese, almonds, salmon, spinach, beef, broccoli, it's pretty easy to get in um, enough um, riboflavin. Again, notice that I'm harping on this to make a point, but grains are often listed as one of your best ways to get um, your B vitamins. And if you look here, whole wheat bread is really low um, as a source compared to some of the other, well, of course, they don't have the amounts, but I know that I listed these by what are the highest. So milk is the highest, eggs would be next. So there are several other foods that you can get more, more from, actually. So, okay, moving on. Our next one is B3, niacin. And the milligrams, um, DRI are a little bit higher for male. Again, the first number is for male. 
The second number is for females, so 16 milligrams for men, 14 milligrams for women. Just slight differences there. And again, functions in Krebs cycle energy production. Niacin you need for your deamination of your amino acids, and um, you also need it for fatty acid synthesis. So your deficiency, um, that should be another bullet there, that DEF is deficiency. Symptoms are pellagra, which is the three Ds. When people, um, let's say in third world countries, um, have this, they'll get the combination of dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia. Uh, dementia. So it's um, those are when you have a severe, severe deficiency. You you don't see them too much uh, in anybody up and walking around, but you will see thing more things like fatigue, depression, apathy. So it it's a real important one for production of neurotransmitters. It's also super important apparently for. Um, helping prevent damage to DNA. So the stability of our genome, um, niacin, is real important for. And uh, also another one that uh, is, and because of the ge genetic connection there, is super important for um, cancer prevention. Now niacin is our uh, dear little friend that we all know for um, helping to manage lipids and um, you can take it in higher doses for that and that's because you see there that it helps our body process fatty acids so that's one of the ways that um, that it works for helping for you know cardiovascular health but um, it is one that can be toxic in higher doses we know that um, when you start getting up around 30 milligrams or higher people can get flushing from that but what they're really uh, looking at being cautious with as we started going up and up and up for using niacin to help people um, manage triglycerides in particular, we started to see that um, we could get elevated liver enzymes. So it can cause some liver damage in higher dosages. But it's an excellent way to um, to help control triglycerides in some people, it really seems to some to help some people more than others. So um, it's worth a try adding higher dose niacin if some of your other things aren't working. Um, but good sources again, look here. These are animal protein sources are really your best sources. Turkey, tuna, chicken, all you get about 10 milligrams per three ounce. So again, with a good uh, protein intake it's pretty easy to get the RDA just with um, eating a higher protein diet. Uh, beef is five milligrams per three ounce. Fortified cereal is a you know real good source um, if you can eat some grains and you tolerate them fine. Uh, but your whole grains and legumes you are a decent source but not nearly as high as some of these others. You can also make niacin, your body can make niacin from the amino acid tryptophan. Um, so niacin, again, it's, um, it's a super important. It helps with, um, in particular, I think it seems like it's niacin that can really help with energy. Um, but it's the B complex in total since they all take a role in that Krebs cycle thing. But um, in terms of a typical dosage, um, I'm fine with, you know, 20, 25 milligram dosages. That's a little over RDA, um, although I don't always think it's especially necessary, especially if people are taking in a good bit of pro animal proteins, but um, it's pretty well tolerated. Most people, um, I have seen some people that seem more sensitive to the flushing thing and they'll uh, they'll flush from say 20 milligrams in a multivitamin so you just need to be aware of that. Okay, um, B6. The dosages are um, a little bit lower on this. Um, actually I think it's 1.7 for male and 1.3 for female that should be turned around but that's for adults um, 19 and up. 
And again, it's the cofactor and all these different en enzyme reactions in the body. It's needed for amino acid, nitrogen metabolism, processing. Um, B6 actually is one of the substances that can help the conver conversion of tryptophan to niacin. And of course, B6 is super important in the conversion of the amino acid precursors into our serotonin, dopamine, norepi, GABA, even needed for heme synthesis. Why would that be? It's because it's so important for amino acid processing. And uh, B6 is um, especially important for conversion of homocysteine to cysteine. So it's another real important one that we'll see nervous system effects in, so depression and mood and even carpal tunnel. People have ele elevated homocysteine. We want to make sure they're getting adequate B6 and folate and B12. And um, can uh, influence cognitive uh, decline. Kidney stones, when people have a tendency towards kidney stones, B6 is one of the important nutrients to supplement in people. And you can get plenty of B6 from a, a wide variety of foods, but some of your better sources are potatoes, uh, chicken, turkey, salmon, banana, spinach. Um, interesting uh, vegetable juice cocktail like B8 is actually a decent source. Um, you can get in too much B6 in these very high dosages um, when you start approaching 100 milligrams. Uh, and 100 milligrams is set as the upper limit. Um, numbness and tingling in the fingers is the most common thing that you'll see. And um, so if people take um, 500 milligrams per day uh, for a while, that's when you'll start to see that numbness and tingling um, set in. I, I've actually seen it set in in lower doses, but um, but I have seen that uh, here and there. Where I'll tell you where I saw that is uh, in people that were doing chelation. And um, once they went off of chelation, they stayed on that very high vitamin and mineral that they were given for when they were taking uh, chelation and uh, when they were no longer on the chelation, they didn't need the high dose and they got the symptoms. That's uh, one example I can remember for sure. Okay, folate. Our um, DRI is now set at 400 micrograms per day for folate and it gets converted to the active form, the tetrahydrofolate or tetrahydrofolic acid. And it's one of the super, super important ones for maintenance of our DNA and RNA for synthesis and repair. So not just for maintenance, but for synthesis as, as, as we're um, making it. Um, it's, so it's real important in cellular division, genetic transmission. And so it's one of our major methyl donors that's super important for epigenetics. So it's those methyl tags on our genes that um, influence the expression of our genes. And uh, it helps convert homocysteine to methionine and then on to SAMe. There's supposed to be an E on the end of there. Sorry about that. And again, another real you know, important one in, de in depression and anxiety issues, um, if you see people with elevated homocysteine, it's uh, the, the um, nutrient responsible for when you don't get enough, it causes a megaloblastic anemia. And of course, we, you know, how folate became very well known was when um, pregnant women don't get enough, it can cause neural tube defects in the baby. So because of the elevated homocysteine, if you don't get enough folate, you're at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and especially stroke, um, increased risk for cancer and Alzheimer's and other dementia. It's also super important playing a role Again, because of this um, DNA repair, it, uh, it's uh, a nutrient involved in cervical dysplasia. When women develop cervical dysplasia, give uh, high-dose folate to help 
uh, turn that around. Of course, I never like giving a B vitamin alone, but I might give high do dose folate and then give a B complex in, in addition. So the so dietary sources, leafy greens are always um, pretty darn high in folate. Oranges are actually a good source of folate, oranges and orange juice, and your beans and legumes. Um, the reason that there's an upper limit set for folate is because if people take in a ton of folate, it can actually mask a B12 deficiency. Okay, next is just a reminder, and I'm sure most of you do this already, but um, we try to make sure that everybody gets screened for the MTHFR um, polymorphism the, uh, to make sure that their body can convert folate to the active form. If they have that polymorphism and they can't, they're going to be more prone to blood clots, to depression, and um, so it's super important to make sure that, that people get screened for that. And if I'm doing if I'm doing folate, for example, to you know to try to help get homocysteine down or to um, take care of amegaloblastic anemia, you can go up to 4,000 micrograms per day. But then I I do try to get it back down to a 4 to 800 milligram do microgram dose, so we we don't take a chance on masking any B12 problems. Okay, next we're we have um, B12. Um, the DRI is 2.4 micrograms per day, which is pretty low. Um, this is one where people tend to do much higher dosage. It's a super, again, super important methyl donor, another one that you need to, to bring homocysteine down. Another, again, important for the metabolism of all our carbohydrates carbohydrates, protein, and fat, but B12 um, is super important for nerve axon growth and maintenance and formation of the myelin sheath. And that's uh, the one that tends to be most responsible for neuropathies, is B12 depletion. But a lot of people don't realize that it also plays a role in, in bone cell and in bone activity and metabolism. And um, you know, that it works along with the folate to make, uh, most people know it works along with folate for red blood cells. So anemia, you know, folate and B12 will be important in um, correcting non-iron deficiency anemias. So B12 is an interesting uh, vitamin because you need that intrinsic factor and you need good um, stomach acid production to absorb it. And so because uh, as people grow older, they tend to lose their intrinsic factor and their HCL production may go down. That's why you tend to see elderly people that are more at risk for developing B12 deficiency. And when I was doing conventional dietetics, I, I always liked it when I saw um, very proactive nursing homes that were very good about testing all their, their um, residents for B12 deficiency. Um, what I would say is the most common thing that you'll see uh, for B12 deficiency is uh, symptoms are either elevated homocysteine or anemias, but you will see uh, B12 will, can really help depression, especially in elderly, or if an elderly patient seems disoriented. B12 is usually the culprit there. Um, if you have numbness and tingling in the extremities or neuropathies, you think first usually of B12 and um, Bell's palsy. Sources are seafood, fish, again look at these animal protein sources as being your best source. Um, brewer's yeast or nutritional yeast is a very good source, um, but it would take two rounded teaspoons to even to get the RDA and that's a little bit hard to take in every single day. So I prefer to get it from more from your um, animal protein sources. Okay, let's move along here so I can make sure I get through the, our slides in a decent time. Um, 
I didn't have time to go through all the minerals um, like Ed hoped. I wanted to highlight a couple of the minerals and uh, you'll see why in a moment. But um, magnesium is one of the minerals that we just feel, and I'm sure that most people do an integrated practice now, it's a, one of the minerals that we pay a lot of attention to because not only is it needed for healthy teeth and bones, but it is super important for helping prevent type 2 diabetes. It helps insulin sensitivity. So it not only will play a role in glucose regulation, but it will play a role in blood pressure. And um, when people have a tendency to have very tight muscles because magnesium is needed for muscle relaxation, I always think of magnesium and I, I help people replete magnesium to help take care of that problem. People have say, I go to a masseuse and you know, 20 minutes after I come out of there, my muscles are tight again. They need magnesium. Um, and magnesium, for that same reason, can help constipation and migraine headaches. So it's a, a super important um, individual mineral to pay attention to. Magnesium, same type of thing. This is a trace mineral. Uh, we only need 55 micrograms per day as a DRI, but so important for detoxification processes in the body conversion of thyroid hormones, and that's just a super important trace mineral for, um, for our health. Um, dietary, you can get the D, well over the DRI in one Brazil nut, believe it or not. And then again, your animal proteins are good sources, and actually whole grains are a, a better source of this particular nutrient, but not everybody can tolerate whole grains. Okay, let's move on. And that's just uh, one of the, uh, an early study that sort of brought to attention how big of a role selenium can play in cancer reduction. Okay, let's move on. It's because it's needed for detoxification um, enzymes in the, in the liver. This was one that uh, found the combination of omega-3 uh, fats along with vitamin A and selenium helped um, Ear infections help to reduce uh, ear infection symptoms in children. Okay, let's move on. So um, there are a whole lot of other vitamins and minerals I didn't get to talk about, and you're sure more than welcome if you've enjoyed this series to request another one at some point. I'll be glad to pick it back up and go into more of the individual nutrients. Um, and the next slide shows a few more. And it's just amazing all the different, you know, nutrients that our body needs and all the things in foods that help us stay healthy, including the phytonutrients, which do not fall into a, you know, there are substances in plants that have a really important activity for our health, and they're not a vitamin or mineral, though, but our body still needs them. Okay, next slide. So these are just some of the actions that these phytonutrients perform in the body. Next slide, Libby. Now, this is the big, uh, I just love these. Um, this is a nutrient uh, nutrient database uh, website. Oh, I thought I had, I, I hope I have the link on one of these slides. If we don't, I'll make sure we post it, um, add it to the slides before we post it. But I love comparing the nutritional intake of different foods. What I want you to see here is look at this apple. An apple is about 65 calories, so the green beans are a little lower in calories. But look at the difference in the carb content. One apple contains 62 grams of carb, whereas green beans only contain 9.8 grams of carb. And you'll see they each have a little fat, much less in the green beans than the apple, and a little bit of protein. But for that uh, carb load in apples, and we always hear, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Look at the difference in the vitamin A content between green beans and an apple. Much higher vitamin A content in green beans. Uh, a good bit higher vitamin C. And you don't think of green beans as a vitamin C for, source. Much higher in folate, much higher in choline. Um, 183, 
all your fruits and vegetables are very good sources of potassium and you need potassium to um, help control blood pressure. It's just as important as magnesium. An adequate intake of your potassium can really help um, your body balance the sodium intake much better. So I think of fruits and vegetables as insurance against you know, high blood pressure if for no other reason than the potassium content alone. But look how much more magnesium and there's selenium in green beans, whereas there is not any in an apple. And a uh, little bit of B vitamins. Um, and actually, you'd be surprised how much vitamin E. We always, I think, tend to think of vitamin E as our nuts and seeds and our grains as our best sources. But actually, you get a good bit of um, fatty acids in any plant. So your, your fruits and vegetables give you a little bit of vitamin E even. But the point is the nutrient density, how much more you can get from those green beans in that much lower carb and um, somewhat lower calorie package. Now, look at whole wheat. So one slice of whole wheat bread is about 69 calories. You get 12 grams of carb, 4 grams of protein, and a little bit of fat. And you get, look at, look at the difference in the nutrition intake almost no vitamin A, no vitamin C. You get some folate, some choline, a little bit of potassium, a decent amount of magnesium in whole grains, um, being honest, and a, usually you'll see a decent amount of selenium. But what I want to point out is the difference in the um, niacin B6 and rib riboflavin. It's not a ton. I mean, that's decent on niacin, but that's next to nothing on your B6 and riboflavin. And the reason I wanted to point this out is, bec again, because um, when I first started seeing um, criticisms of people going off of wheat, feeling that they, they wanted to test out or explore whether they had gluten uh, sensitivity or to intolerance issues, and people were saying, oh, you've got to get whole wheat, you've got to get whole wheat, you need it for the B vitamins. Well, that's really the last thing you need it for. Um, it is a decent, uh, there, there are plenty of other foods that supply those nutrients, in particular your animal proteins. So you're not going to be lacking niacin, B6, or riboflavin if you don't eat whole wheat. It is a decent source of selenium, but um, if I have people not able to eat whole wheat because they truly do have gluten intolerance, I put them on to nuts and seeds, and in particular Brazil nuts. Uh, so if you look at getting um, more significant um, nutrients from these, um, you really have to go up in the amount that you take in. This is a cup of whole wheat flour, and it's just not a good nutritional deal because you have to take in way too many grams of carbs and way too many calories to get up there on the, on the nutrients. So that was the point. So look at nuts and seeds. These are just jam-packed little nutrition powerhouses. You don't get a lot of vitamin A or C, but you really get decent amounts of your vitamin E, decent amounts of folate, again, potassium, and look how many minerals, calcium and magnesium. So when you want to get people taking in more minerals, one of the best food categories to do it with is your nuts and seeds. And that's what I wanted you to see here, was how much of the calcium and magnesium. That's one little ounce of almonds. That's not very much, and that's a really good amount of minerals. On Brazil nut, um, you do happen to get, um, uh, the, I think this was one ounce of Brazil nuts, and look at all that selenium. And that's why one little Brazil nut alone will give you the over the RDA for selenium. Okay, next slide. I wanted to show you something interesting about lettuce. I can never understand why people say don't even bother to eat iceberg lettuce because there is no nutrition in it whatsoever. Okay, on vitamin e, I, uh, A, I grant you it's much lower than naturally a darker leafy, you know, uh, green. So compared to red leaf lettuce, for example, it's much lower in vitamin A. 
but uh, it's comparable, if not a little higher, in vitamin C. It actually has a little bit of vitamin E, a little bit, uh, and it's pretty good source of folate, surprisingly. Uh, decent on choline, really good on potassium, um, not as as strong on calcium, but um, comparable on magnesium. And so, if people want to eat a little bit of iceberg head lettuce here or there, I I don't. Um, I don't see any reason not to. Yes, you can get way more vitamin A with your deeper, richer greens, but um, you know, sometimes I'll order a wedge salad from Iceberg Head Lettuce when I'm out at a restaurant. I look at it almost as kind of a junk food, but you get a decent amount of nutrition in it. It's not like it's ridiculously low. So um, if I if they say no nutrition, I would expect to see all zeros on that left-hand column. <laughs> you just don't see it. So I just thought that you guys would get a kick out of knowing exactly what is truly in iceberg lettuce. <laughs> so are we meeting nutrition needs today? Um, you know, we're not seeing outright deficiencies, but yes, we see, you know, deficiency symptoms here and there. And we especially see problems from chronic long-term under intake of specific nutrients like chromium and magnesium in particular for blood sugar regulation. So, um, you know, we gotta, we got to help people out sometimes and you have to um, look at what they have going on with their, with their health. Um, you see people that just have a lot of insulin resistance have a very hard time controlling blood sugar, for example. You want to give chromium, magnesium, zinc, vanadium. You want to give those blood sugar regulating nutrients. Okay, let's move on. So that was what I wanted to show you with my next slides is that's our whole approach with the metabolic code. Um, not just the, the diet itself will, is ancillary to this. We you know, if I have somebody that has a lot of insulin resistance, would we'll take the edge off of the demand by lowering that glycemic load. Uh, if we see people that have inflammation issues, we take down the food allergen, um, the common food allergens to lower inflammation. And we work all that together along with micronutrients and supplements to, to help them be effective with uh, their health needs. Okay, moving on. So I wanted to show you some examples. Um, one of the things we evaluate with our health assessment questionnaire in the Metabolic Code program is blood sugar. So these are some examples of some of the questions on blood sugar regulating um, issues. And if they come up high between on their score, on the, between their answers on the questionnaire, and especially adding in the labs, and one of the big, big things here that will make people score a lot of points, it's weighted to score more points if people say, when I gain weight, I gain it in my midsection. Because we know that's the weight that's caused by insulin resistance, is weight that comes on around the waist. Okay, moving on. So the next slide shows what we would do. Improve the diet. So the metabolic code diet is a low glycemic load diet. And then we would give them supplemental support. So our Metabolic Code Diet product for blood sugar regulation is GlutReg4. And it contains chromium in the polynicotinate form, alpha-lipoic acid, which is a nutrient I didn't get to talk about, uh, benfotiamine, which is a uh, thiamine, um, fat-soluble form of thiamine, a uh, new nutrient that uh, they just found out about called PQQ and vanadium. And that is our combination product and I have seen that product alone turn around um, energy and insulin resistance in people with mild insulin resistance. If they have more advanced insulin resistance, we need to do the low glycemic load and we may want to give them magnesium separately. In fact, we almost always do. And then if their insulin resistance has progressed to the point that it's caused lipid elevation, then we'll add a product like Triendohelin, which will help um, specifically to help regulate the lipids better. So that's how we put it all together to help people get the uh, outcome that they want without having to, hopefully, without having to go on a drug. 
So this is just extra information on alpha lipoic acid, what it does, how it helps with um, blood glucose balance and um, regulation. Um, move on through Libby because I'm running a little bit long. A little bit more information on benfotiamine. So that's a super ingredient. And it actually has clinical studies showing uh, that it improves all those things that you see in insulin resistant people. Um, going back, Libby, the uh, end product of endothelial dysfunction that happens from insulin resistance, the advanced glycation end products, the markers of inflammation, retinopathy symptoms, all improved with uh, going on benfotiamine. That's how powerful that ingredient is. Okay, next one, PQQ. So it, it, it uh, improves insulin signaling and glucose by being a mitochondrial catalyst. It improves the burning of the fuel once it gets in there, which helps keep creating the um, ability to take in the glucose and um, get it out of the blood. Okay, so PQQ, next one. So this is just uh, another example. We go through thyroid. If you go to the next slide, Libby, the uh, thyroid, this is our thyroid support product, our thyro uh, metab. Contains the uh, base amino acid tyrosine that's needed to make thyroid hormones, along with the trace minerals, chromium and selenium that are needed for conversion and production, and bladder rack, which is a natural source of iodine, along with ashwagandha, adaptogenic herb, and coleus. Okay, moving on. And that just explains what I just went through. Coleus helps that cell cellular energy production. So that's what our program is. We have specific formulas and supplements to address different needs. So if someone has a stress and sleep need, these are the products that we use there. And next one, these are our products for other uh, areas of metabolic disruption, gut health, toxicity, inflammation. And it all is important because let's say you know you have a person that comes in and they say, I'm telling you, I am in a lot of pain all the time, a lot of inflammation. I have joint pain that keeps me from really being able to exercise. Uh, we put them on inhibitox so they don't have to take NSAIDs to be out of pain. And it helps them become more active without breaking down their gut. So just to give you an example, um, this was a testimonial we got just last week from one of our practitioners who said that he put his client on the, um, the metabolic code program that was recommended from the air support questionnaire and put them on the diet and in two months got triglycerides down from 422 to 122. A dramatic. So this was combination of diet with supplements. The VLDL went from 2,800 small particle to 1,100, a very uh, low risk number, moderate to low risk. And LDL, look at that improvement, still not at an ideal, but much, much better in only two months. And HDL went up to a much better level, and only in two months. And I'm telling you, you see it over and over and over again, how, uh, how impactive this combination of knowing what to do with diet, knowing how to support the body with nutrients and, and dietary supplement ingredients, uh, amazing the results that you can get. So I hope this um, inspired you to take a little bit closer look at some of on the micronutrients um, and uh, you've got good information. We'll open up for questions. Um, next time I am going to talk about uh, diet for thyroid, food and nutrient strategies for optimal thyroid function. You know there's a lot to, to diet for thyroid and one of the things that comes up and for example is the intake of goitrogens. When you're recommending a very high fruit, fruit and vegetable diet um, the intake of goitrogens can go up. So what do you do about that? So those are the types of things I'll talk about next time. Thanks, Laura. We do have 
Uh, one question here. What is the mechanism of kidney stone prevention with B6? Oh, let me think here. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think it has to do with the... Actually, I think it has to do with the um, amino acid metabolism, um, nitrogen handling, somehow impacting those, um, those oxalates, uric acid production and oxalates. But um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know exactly. But I do know that um, when we are working with kidney stones, we, we up the intake of magnesium and B6. And um, and I usually do other B vitamins along with that, so we don't have a problem from too much of one vitamin. Um, and um, dramatically increasing the intake of those two things will usually do really well to help prevent uh, the development of kidney stones in the future. And I also look at just alkalinizing people, making sure that they um, can get the pH up of the urine and saliva uh, because we do know that the increased acidity makes the um, makes the um, oxalates come um, out of solution and develop into the stone. We also have a comment that uh, there is interest in another series for additional nutrients and okay. another question what is the best multivitamin for general overall health is photo multi a good all-around vitamin um, photo multi yes maybe it's a brand I'm not sure mm. you know I'm not familiar with that one the biggest thing I can tell you that I look for in terms of the quality of the multi is the, um, I really like, I much prefer the activated forms of the nutrients. So um, I don't like just straight folate. I like uh, either a blend of folate with MTHF or all MTHF, um, for example. I like activated. Um, B6, you know, to the pyridoxal 5-phosphate is the activated form. And I look for things like, do they have, um, instead of just alpha tocopherol, do they have mixed tocopherols? Or if they have just vitamin E, do they have it in a good, um, suc like I mentioned in my last one, the succinate form is a better form of that. And also, are the, um, the minerals... Um, in a good absorbable form, like an amino acid chelated form. That's the the uh, what I look for. Um, you know, mixed mixed tocopherols, mixed carotenoids, um, and activated forms of of the vitamins. Uh, a comment came through that yes, that was a Metagenics uh, product, the Photo Multi. Um, it's like another question. Is any suggestions for gallstones? Uh, actually, no. We do not do any of the, um, you know, like the magnesium salt and oil type therapies to try to get gallstones to move out. Um, there's just too many problems from them. I know people that have said that those have worked, but um, they're pretty heroic. Um, the best thing for 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 the gallbladder and for bile salts is to work with the liver. So we'll work with uh, things like um, artichoke extract, um, milk thistle. You know ingredients that um, that support liver health, and you usually have to work on on gut health. And again, um, our belief is that the stones form because of people being way too acidic. So 
we work on getting them alkalinized which the best way to get alkalinized is just to increase fruit and vegetables. I know there's a huge thing out there about becoming uh, vegetarian and not having animal proteins, but interestingly, when we check pH levels on people that come in, you know, as clients, uh, you wouldn't believe how often people that report that they're vegetarian are extremely acidic. And so, um, you know, just taking animal protein out doesn't seem to do it. Um, so we really feel that, uh, and what we see consistently is keeping some animal protein in, but eating a lot of fruits and vegetables um, is the way to go for good alkalinizing. Um, so that's the best I can tell you. Uh, we don't have a product or a protocol for once people have developed um, gallstones. We just um, don't like taking on that liability for one. If people read things on the internet and want to try it, that's up to them. <laughs> but um, once they have formed gallstones, um, we don't we don't mess with it. But you can do things to try to prevent them for in the future if they. But typically, if they have them that bad, um, it'll be hard to work through them, and um, they just have to see if they can get them get them removed or take a medication to help them pass. Uh, question, can we get the products you talked about from you? Uh, so I believe all of the recommendations that you included in the slides were air support, carried in the Air Support online store. Did you sneak any others in there? No, those were all our MCD formulas. So um, if it's a person that's listening that's not a practitioner, uh, yes, you can. Um, I can give you our clinic number. You could get them directly from us at our clinic, 949-464-4451. Um, but if you're a practitioner, you can get access to them through our um, store that's affiliated with our air support um, part of the of our metabolic code program. Yes, and that's actually what the can, bullet point on the slide um, is referring to for registering. Register now at metaboliccode.com for the metabolic code system, which is the assessment tool, air support, and the lifestyle tool, lifestyle guidance portal. I'd be glad to. Um, do a demo for anyone who needs any information. Everything's available on the website. I appreciate everyone being here this evening. Look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. I will have that posted on our events page uh, later in the month. Again, thanks, Laura. And everyone have a great evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Good night.